as far as whether this, the, my presentation can clarify anything in Coast Redwood, I don't know if I want to make that jump. But So I'm going to be talking about giant sequoia, of which there is not basal sprouting. So there is not asexual reproduction, reproduction in giant sequoia. So off the bat, that's a big difference between the two taxa. Um, so I'm going to be talking about giant, uh, giant sequoia genetic diversity. And I just wanted to let you know, first off, I didn't put it on there. So this work has been done by myself and my uh, major advisor, Richard Dodd. Um, so we're both at UC Berkeley. So first off, I kind of thought maybe I should give a teeny bit of a background about giant sequoia, since most of this seemed focused more about Coast Redwood. Uh, so giant sequoia is another long-lived tree species. Um, it's the largest tree in the world. Um, it occurs in about 70 groves across the western slope of the Sierra Nevada. And as you can see, um, it has a highly fragmented range, and you have increased fragmentation as you move north. So it occurs from about the same latitude as Lake, Lake Tahoe to about a little bit northeast of Bakersfield. So it's not a very large range. And then if you look at this image below, um, that's a sort of zoom in on the southern range. So I wanted to highlight that although the southern range has a lot more populations in it, it still is fragmented. So the populations tend to still be distinct and separate. Um, so some of the major threats that are facing giant sequoia, so there's a sort of regeneration problem in the groves, and that's attributed by and large to fire suppression because this is a fire dependent species. Um, and there's a question mark with regard to climate change. So the populations of giant sequoia tend to be really small and are highly fragmented. So these are both traits that are not desirable for sort of a change in environmental conditions um, that is going to be, that is upon us. Um, and some of our previous work has also suggested that there's been a long-term decline in giant sequoia over sort of the last couple million years uh, and with the onset of the glacial cycles. So that means the population size has been reducing over time. Um, so our motivating question is sort of how resilient are these populations to environmental change? So for us, it really centers on genetic diversity, adaptive potential, and then gene flow. So that sort of part is like, so how diverse are these populations? Is some of this diversity functional diversity? And how does this diversity move across the landscape. So that's really important when conditions change, because you, if you have a larger pool of diversity, you have more potential for some of that to be suitable to the future conditions. Um, so just a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about today. So first, I wanted to touch on the plaster grove, because it's a really interesting grove, which I'll get into later. Um, and then I'm going to sort of talk about the difference between what's happening in the north section of the range versus the south section of the range. And then I'm going to go a little deeper into sort of fine scale genetic structure within the stands, and then talk about some broad patterns and future work that we are doing in our lab. So Placer Grove is this outlier grove that's about 60 miles from the closest grove, which is North Calaveras. So I don't know if anybody's familiar with uh, the range of giant sequoia. It has only six adult individuals in it, so it is tiny. Um, it has extremely low diversity. So we have 11 markers that we've been describing the genetic diversity with. And they're fairly variable in the rest of the range. But in these trees, five of the 11 showed no variation at all. Um, you also have really low rates of really low levels of heterozygosity. So that's another indicator that um, the diversity is low and there is potential um, Maybe in breeding, well, I could get to that a little bit later, but in a different sense, not selfing. Um, so, and it's also very divergent from other groves. So this means the composition there uh, is very different from any of the other groves across the range. And this FST value that's of 0.3 is really high in natural, like across the natural range of a pop, uh, tree species. So that's very elevated. Um, so there are two individuals that are young in this grove. So a lot of people were wondering, are, are these natural regeneration that's happening in this grove? And to sort of make a long story short, no, it's not, unfortunately. Um, the genetics sort of tell us that they couldn't be the product of those six mature trees. So therefore, they have been planted. And pl intentionally or unintentionally, as far as the Forest Service has told me, they have no record of an intentional planting of these two individuals. They have done planting there. Most of it has been unsuccessful. Um, so 
there's more to that story. So we also did some seed germinations. So we got, we got some seed from the six mother trees, and we germinated that seed. And we found that there were evidence in this seed of pollen coming from trees that were not those six mature adult individuals. So we thought this was really interesting, and then we sort of found out that there is a plantation of giant sequoia that is about 50 feet, 50 to 100 feet away, so really close. And this plantation was planted in 1951 um, from the Lions Club, I think the Auburn Lions Club. Um, so that means the tree is about 65 years old. So potentially at that point where they might be starting to reach reproductive maturity. So the answer to this is there's pollen either coming from those trees, which originated from the mountain home grove, which is in the southern portion of the range, or there is pollen coming from one of these two young individuals. And one of the young individuals is of significant size. It's about the same size as the plantation trees. So it could potentially also be producing pollen, although nobody has noticed pollen production yet other than the genetic saying that there's. I see a hand raising. Is this the yes. Yeah. Um, so that's the sort of story in Placer. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and then some of our other work is sort of trying to talk about gene flow and how the gene flow dynamics vary across, across the range. So we found that the in the northern portion of the range where you have eight populations, so including Placer and McKinley, which I haven't noted here, there's these other six populations, which we sort of form as population pairs because they're relatively close to each other. So we wanted to know, is there any genetic exchange between these groves? And how different are they from each other? So we actually found that they're quite divergent from each other, and there's very little genetic exchange across the landscape. And so you're looking at a distance of maybe two kilometers to nine kilometers, so it would be long distance gene flow. But because they are so divergent, we're actually it suggests that these populations have been separated for quite a long time and that there has been little genetic exchange over that time period. And of course, if you look at, so this is, this is like a plot from a program called Structure, which tries to group your data based on the genetics and it doesn't take into account geography. So therefore, if it correctly assigns it, it sort of shows you that the genetics of each population are distinct. Um, but you do see a couple of sort of exceptions, so if you look I mean, it's hard to see from the side, but there's a couple of colors that don't seem like they belong. So there's the North Calaveras is a couple of individuals. So each bar is an individual. So those probably represent sort of gene flow events. And this is effective gene flow because these are actual individuals that are on the landscape. So we can't say how much pollen is getting there and seed that aren't successful. Um, so the story here seems to be that these groves have been separated for a long time and there's sort of very rare events of gene flow among them. Um, so then you go to the southern, southern part of the range where you have the majority of the populations and the majority of the individuals um, and you get a completely different story. You get a low divergence between populations and you get graphs that look like this where they sort of assign the each individual to halfway sort of 50% to either population. So that shows you that these are really connected by gene flow. So, and just for sort of perspective, Freeman Creek and Long Meadow, they are 20 kilometers apart, but there's a lot of groves that come between them. So we think that maybe that gene flow is occurring across this landscape in a sort of stepwise fashion, where populations are sort of connected to their adjacent populations, which connects them to the next adjacent. And that way, the sort of southern portion of the range is able to sort of remain cohesive genetically. Um, all right, I'm going to move on. And I just wanted to just highlight, this is some work that we have done in the past, and it's sort of, we confirmed some of these results about the, how the, the northern range is sort of operating different than the southern range. We also find that there's been a long-term decline sort of with the glacial cycles in giant sequoia, which has resulted likely in um, the fragmentation of the range. So the range was once more continuous, and now it's sort of being broken up because populations are shrinking. Um, and then I wanted to talk a little about fine-scale genetic structure. So that's sort of what does the ge genetic variation look like within a population across the landscape? So before I do that, I wanted to make sure I talked a little bit about this metric that we're using called neighborhood size, because um, I'm sure it's not obvious to anyone. Um, I think it wasn't obvious to me before I learned about it. So that tries to take into account that each individual, individual tree is more likely to mate with other individual trees that are closer to them. 
So it's not like mating is even across a population if it's large. So that's really important for trees that are distributed over a larger area and sort of continuously distributed. So you can think of that as sort of an individual tree with a sort of range around it, aware and within, within this range, the individuals are randomly mating with each other. And I know it's like a sort of abstract concept, so I like to think of it as sort of a circle around every individual that represents sort of a mating group, and you have these circles sort of overlapping and interacting across your population. Um, so then if you, t so we looked at the fine scale genetic structure within three populations. So North Calaveras is a quite a small population. It's about less than half of a square kilometer. And there are a little bit over 100 mature individuals within a North Calaveras. So there we found the neighbors in size. So this circle encompasses 51 individuals. And the radius of that circle is about 0.2 kilometers. So that means that the sort of average dispersal distance, and it doesn't account for long distance dispersal, and it only accounts for effective dispersal, actual individuals that have grown up, is about that size. That's what this is. It's an indirect measure, though, so there are a lot of issues with that. But that's what it's saying is the bulk of the dispersal is within this space. And within that space, there are 51 individuals. So we see that the neighborhood size versus the total population size, the difference is not very large. So that means there's not a lot of like, local genetic structure within North Calabaris. And then if you look at Nelder, which is just a little bit south, um, quite near Mariposa Grove in Yosemite, um, you find a grove where the, the spatial scale of a neighborhood size is about approximately the same. So you're thinking that um, the dispersal distance is around the same. But the individuals within that are much fewer. So we think that this is explained a lot because the density of trees at Nelder is much less. Nelder has some history of logging, and it is much more spread out. And within the sort of designated grove area at Nelder, you also have pockets of giant sequoia and pockets of forest that have no giant sequoia. So you're sort of averaging the structure across this area, a bigger area than the actual giant sequoia is covering. I know that's a little bit fluffy, what that actually means. So that, that equates to this neighborhood size being smaller and a larger amount of genetic structure within this grove. Um, and then lastly, you get to giant forest and you see something totally different. You see the neighborhood size grows immensely, so you have over a kilometer of size of your circle, and you have 174 individuals. So we think that is answered by two things. So at giant forest, trees are much more dense. Um, so there's a lot more giant sequoia per unit area there. And then the other flip side of that is that you have a much larger grove. So if you think visually of these circles, and you think of the edges of these groves, in giant sequoia, you have a lot more circles in an area, so you have gene flow sort of coming in from a lot of different directions. So that equates to a sort of larger scale of genetic diversity and sort of a um, larger scale of spatial genetic diversity, excuse me, and sort of less structure. Um, and then I'll move on. So just to briefly touch on some range-wide patterns that we have found. So we found just in general that there's higher genetic diversity in the south versus the north. But a lot of this appears to be correlated with grove size, although we'd like to do some more sampling in the south because you know, we do have some standouts, like you know, allelic richness, which is just a measure of genetic diversity, was highest in Freeman Grove, which is much lar smaller than giant forest, for instance. So we want to do, we're doing more sampling in the south to understand these dynamics better. Um, and then we also got a measure of FST. So this is a measure of how much of the total variation is among populations versus within. So that means this is saying to us that a significant amount of the diversity in giant sequoia is among populations. So it matters where you sample. It matters where the population is if you're trying to capture genetic diversity. Um, OK, so what does this mean? Um, so we found that overall genetic diversity is really low, and that's low sort of compared to other conifer species. Um, and it's especially low in these small northern groves. So, and then also the northern groves are very distinct. So if you're thinking of genetic diversity conservation, these northern groves might be high priority for conservation. Um, on the flip side of that, in the southern part of the range, a lot of these populations appear genetically homogeneous. Um, so therefore, you know, we can argue about this, and 
I think all populations should be protected, but you could say that if you, some of those blink on and off, that's not a huge loss as far as overall genetic diversity of the species. Although we do have, think that there are some potential outlier groves in the south, so we're doing more work on that. Um, another thing that's also ongoing in our lab is working with adaptive genetics. So right now we're working with neutral markers, which really tell you great things about gene flow and things like that. But we want to get into things that can be functional. So we've started developing methods of RAD sequencing. So we chose RAD sequencing because it has the potential to capture this functional DNA, but also you can reduce genomic coverage. So another concept that I'm not sure everybody here knows about, but the gen genome size, close redwood is huge, but giant square is also a very large genome. So if you want to incorporate more individuals at a cer sort of certain cost, you need to cut down on the amount of the genome that you're covering. So you want to cut down on the genome, but you still want to capture important functional variation. So RAD sequencing is a good tool to do that. Um, and it has been successfully used in multiple tree species. So what you do is you take your sequence data and you correlate it with the variation in climate across the range. And you might look for areas where it's hotter or drier because those vari the variants that are in those locations are indicative of local adaptation to that climate condition. So in the time of climate change, you know, the hot, rain, hot dry range extremes that giant square currently occupy, those genetic, that genetic variation that's there, it might be really important for the persistence of the species as a whole. Um, and lastly, we think this um, genetic information is really important as far as seed collection strategies. So if you want to use a neighborhood size to sort of design your seed collection within a grove to capture diversity, use that for assisted migration or planting. And then I think I'm running out of time, but there's always this question of, in Placer, is like, do we want plantations and natural populations to mix? Maybe it's bad because you're an uh, evolutionary purist. Maybe it's good because of climate change and moving southern genetic material to more northern locations is a great idea and will help, persist, help the species persist in the long run. So thank you. <laughs> Okay, is there any questions? Yes. The breakup of the groves, is that in that way historically? Is it people caused? So the breakup of the groves has been that way historically. I mean, some of the groves have been highly logged, but I don't know as many have been removed. But what are over the longer term, our genetic evidence says that the range was more continuous in the deeper past, okay. and then it has broken up naturally through the glacial cycles. And then did you have a question? Oh, yeah. I just had a quick question about what would be your real answer about um, how you feel about that plantation in the North Grove. If you were the forest manager so, there. So Placer has no natural regeneration happening, so I think that that's a grove that's kind of going out. And I, I guess my thought is that it's not terrible, although it might maintain some, some giant sequoia in that presence, but although there's a little bit of complexity because since that plantation is like 30 or 40 individuals, it also will probably gen swamp the genetics, so you'll lose some of that variation. But mm -hmm. since there isn't successful regeneration, I think there's a question of whether that will persist over the long term anyway. So I lean towards moving, like letting it be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is the reason that there's no um, regeneration in the classical growth because the forest service is in that area? I think that's part of the story, and I talked to a couple people that are working on that, and they're trying to work on thinning the forest there. Um, but I don't know if that's the whole story. You know, the, um, we had really low germination rates on those seeds as well, which kind of made us wonder a little bit about, like, you know, since all those individuals are very similar genetically, if inbreeding in the sense of re related individuals, not necessarily selfing, was reducing our uh, germination rates, our seed germination rates. Yes, I'll leave the question. Did the neighborhood uh, study, I'm really interested in um, what you're showing, but in the, one, in the one that only had 10 individuals in this neighborhood, does that mean that there was hygiene flow in that neighborhood because they weren't related? No, what it means is that within that circle, that I see, like that visual circle, there's only 10 individuals, so that means that individuals are not mating with very many other individuals around them. So that means that there's sort of 
I want to say there's more structuring of the diversity. So within little pockets, there's more different genetics. And they're more mating with each other. So they're more geographically separated. And then where does that, you know, then their pollen had to come from somewhere else if it wasn't coming from their neighbor. So it is coming from the neighbor. The neighborhood size is saying where the pollen and the seed are coming so there's from. There's only 10 in the, in the one. So does that mean that? So Most of the pollen for the, so the one is in the center and the 10 are around, within that space around it. So it means that most of the reproduction is happening within from that one to the other nine, or other 10, I think it's other 10 individuals in that space, in that one location. That's what it's meaning. So it's, it's bad in a sense. It's better to have a bigger number, neighborhood size as far as that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>